Welcome back for part three of the history of uh, CCM at NUNM. And uh, let's go back to screen share here. Okay, so some other influences just to see how broad this concept, you know, none of this is being is taught within a regular TCM curriculum, not that we are necessarily teaching that at NUNM, but Chinese medicine is vast. That's what classical Chinese medicine means. It's a vast repository of all kinds of natural medicine practices, holistic practices that not just, you know, acupuncture herbs and massage and that's it, uh, as the TCM system makes us seem to believe. But for instance, here uh, I'm interviewing uh, a person who is describes himself as an, an alchemist going back to a 2000, coming from a 2000 year old lineage, making alchemical salts, you know, basically firing salts uh, nine times, uh, thousands of degrees, and then waiting for five different colors to appear, only taking the central yellow color, collecting all of the yellows, baking them again, and so on and so forth until you have this, uh, this philosopher's stone at the end that gives you health and, and longevity, longevity. He lived uh, to, to almost 100 and uh, inspired a whole, you know, his disciples still active. Um, here is um, here is Master Liu, uh, who is uh, uh, an, an, a Siberian peasant, really, or on the Chinese side of the Siberian steppes uh, in in northeast China, um, who is uh, practicing at age eighty, uh, still. The, the art and science of treating serious diseases by adjusting people's emotions through devices like storytelling, for instance. Uh, Lori and Tammy in our program are making that particular part available to uh, our students very often during the summertime as an elective. Uh, the the Shanyan Dao uh, practices basically of the educator and philosopher Wang Fengyi from the late 1800s. Here are just a couple of shots, just, you know, Dr. Uh, Long, who has since retired, one of the earliest people coming over from Chengdu with Dr. Zhang, Hao Shang on his side, more pictures of us during the late 90s here, picture taken during graduation, this is gathering at my house probably 15 or so years ago. Um, this is a, in Lori's office here with Dr. Wang, Wang Shifu in the background picture taken in 96, him doing the Bagua. You've probably all seen that picture. Uh, and then of course, generation after generation, you guys graduating, uh, here is the picture taken after the oath ceremony uh, probably, I don't know, uh, five years ago, we have Bob Crin in here, Jim Cleaver is still teaching, Roger Batchelor was still uh, with us, etc. Brenda Hood, you see there, Dr. Chen uh, Xiaoli in the foreground. Uh, so um, this tradition started right at the beginning and we've kept this up until now, having, an, in addition to your regular graduation, having this oath ceremony where there's a more ritual handing over of each teacher's unique lineages, uh, empowering you to step into the profession once you have your, your degree. Um, here are more pictures. Daniel Silver is in here, Eric Gray, Sabina Wilms, uh, Brenda Hood, of course. Here you see me already not quite so young and fresh looking anymore. <laughs> A more recent picture. But what I really want to talk to you about the, for the rest of the presentation, the last 15 minutes we have together here today is the history of this remarkable man, Wang Shifu, uh, Wang Qingyu, who is the lineage holder of the Jinjingong, but more as an example of the tremendous difficulty 
that it takes to get to the kinds of teachings you get, whether it's the Qigong or the herbs, or, you know, these were all really taught in secret in the past and um, took tremendous effort and discipline and, and personal commitment to get there. So I want to give you a little, we won't be able to make it all through, but you get a little bit of a flavor. You know, so the Jinjingong venture, you know, while the practices come from the last 2000 years, they were amalgamated during a secret meeting at the beginning of the, uh, at the end of the Qing dynasty, maybe around 1905 on in this cave on Mount uh, Qingcheng called the Jiu Lao Dong, the cave of the nine elders, a very remote cave at the very top uh, where they cloistered, sequestered themselves, uh, you know, monks, uh, martial artists, abbots of monasteries, um, people from the military, et cetera, that were practicing the Jinjing Gong to, to, in, in other forms to amalgamate all their knowledge into one thing that was helpful, they were thinking for the reformation of the country as the kind of strengthening of the national heritage. Here's Du Xin Wu, who is one of, you know, I mentioned him earlier, Sun Yat-sen's bodyguard, who was the student of another person participating in that meeting. Here is the, when Wang Shifu was nine years old, he was sent by his father into this monastery that still exists until this day. You originally used to be a Taoist monastery, now it's Buddhist. And he stayed in, his master stayed in this room here on the left and Wang Shifu stayed on the right and they practiced in this courtyard. It's uh, not, you know, but he lives there anymore. It's a shuttered monastery, but has particular relevance for the Jinjing Gong. He was also taken to this monastery, which was an amalgamate of Taoism, Buddhism, and Confucianism, a rare fusion of these three pillars of Chinese uh, culture, really. And he uh, brought me not only to this monastery, but also here and showed me how his teacher was showing him how to absorb energy from stars in the sky and here from old trees specifically. Wang Shifu was uh, orphaned when he was young. He was the son of a general of the seventh wife of the general uh, living very wealthily with servants, uh, etc. cetera. And it all came to a screeching halt in 1949 when the communists came, his father sort of committed emotional suicide in that he betrayed a lot of his men who then got executed because he was forced to be the mayor of the city and had to help the new regime to, uh, and he, he couldn't stand that. So he slowly died in 1951 and leaving the 14 year old um, Wang Qingyu orphaned uh, and banned as sort of the, the son of riffraff, political riffraff landowners, Guomindang officials, uh, wealthy people, etc., monks. Uh, he was basically sent to the Gulag, not as a prisoner, but to teach in an area where the uh, so called liberation war against the Tibetan uh, populace was still happening, you know, where there was still guerrillas coming down from the mountains. And so it was dangerous. So they sent people, they were expendable. He was a school teacher here. You see him in the back row there as a young man in 1955 uh, with the Tibetan, his Tibetan students. Uh, he married uh, Shimu there, uh, Mrs. Chen, uh, who was the son, the daughter of uh, officials here in this region. And then they made it through the terrible hungers of the 1960s when the Russians pulled out. It's like ultra communist. You can see the slogans in the back. Uh, uh, and, 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 and the close, of course, uh, very um, emaciated, you know, like there was nothing to eat at that time and he, he wasn't allowed to practice his Qigong. So he could only do that at three in the morning in order not to be arrested. You know, now they are 
you know, this was from the trip in 2006 uh, with a group of NUNM students. So they uh, look considerably better fed now and have a good life and are extremely well respected now that Qigong and the ancient uh, arts are kind of in fashion almost. But at that time, Wan Shifu had to kind of practice in secret in the mountains. He always says like a wild animal or in the morning, then uh, later in the 1990s when martial arts became more fashionable, he was allowed to come out and teach of his first disciples and uh, was finally, uh, the army was getting interested in, you know, that in the hidden folk healers of China uh, and were recruiting actively, you know, uh, folk physicians to treat their communist party leaders and Olympic athletes. And uh, this man in the foreground was in the charge of this effort in the martial arts in Taoist uh, internal nourishing, internal alchemy department and discovered Dr. Wang. So he is eternally grateful that he got him from exile in Eastern Tibet where it was bitter cold and very little to eat uh, into the city of Chengdu where he got a lifetime professorship in martial arts and the arts of nourishing life, which he still is fulfilling nowadays. Uh, when I met Shufu uh, in 1990, uh, he was, had become famous because he was treating uh, not only party officials, but here like as a Taiwanese uh, writer and uh, Olympic athletes, etc. cetera. And uh, we were then starting 94 together once he had accepted me as a formal disciple he was sharing all of his contacts with me and we were starting to bring groups starting in 94. I think this is a picture from the 95 trip. You can see my two kids that are now 31 and 26 years old, Benjamin Christopher here little. Uh, uh, here are other pictures of the trip. You see Lori here in the foreground practicing uh, a form, possibly the 14 movements of the Jin Jin Gong. Here's Bill Frazier, here's Jim Cleaver, all teachers at the school. And then we have uh, students now, of course, distinguished alumni of the program who long since uh, become masters in their own right. Here is again, practicing the 14 at the birthplace of Taoism at the Zhang, Zhang and Tian Shidong, the cave of the heavenly teacher in on Mount Qingcheng. Walking practices. This was from the 98 trip. Here's that picture that used to hang in Lori's office. Manchu were doing the Bagua 96, same trip. This was from the 2006 trip, I believe. No, that was also the 96 trip. Yeah, Wang Shifu teaching extremely resourceful, very Renaissance education, all the classics memorized, teaching us to absorb energy from trees, from the rising sun, from the full moon, from, from the ocean, from waterfalls. Uh, you know, he is also full of knowledge of these ancient Wushu training uh, exercises are full of stories, you know, some stuff that you never forget. Like, so it's sort of, always want to write his biography in English because it's so inspiring. And um, more pictures from the trip. Here is uh, separating heaven and earth, teaching during the trip that the Wuling Gong was taught to us in 97. Some martial arts practicing. Uh, Smoothing the ball with Bill, Eagle Walk, 98 trip. And then Wan Shifu coming multiple times here for the very first time when NUNAM's campus was still at Market Street in, on the east side of Portland. It's the first time him coming over in 96. 
uh, I think he came at least four times or so to uh, personally teach. This is the Yahats at the ocean, uh, Breitenbush Hot Springs, Breitenbush Hot Springs teaching the Jinjian Gong. This is uh, the president honoring him by having tea with the faculty and here with his group of disciples, Lori and Tammy and Bill, Kamala Kwali from Eugene. Uh, here's actually the year, many years after myself, when uh, in my bedroom here, Wang Shifu performing the discipleship ceremony for Bill and Lori and Tammy, who I think it was in 2007 or so. Uh, who since then have become also formal disciples of the Jinjingong. Here's Wang Shifu embracing a tree in Port Townsend. He loves nature. And partially, you know, uh, not just for my cancer in nature, but also to have a place, you know, that is more of a center where we can practice Qigong together during the retreats. My clinic is also here. Many of you have been here, of course, is the Taishan Center in my home in Corbett in the Sandy River Gorge. It was also to show Shifu that, you know, this is a physical reality in the Western world now that there's, you know, this lineage that's been banned that you had to practice in, in secret for so many years has uh, become a physical reality, not just at the school but in the form of this private center here, which is further expanded through this new venture of the Viewpoint Inn that is built in the Columbia River Gorge right now. More pictures of people graduating here, some of the later teachers, Ken is in here, uh, Jun He Li is in here, Brand Stickley is in here, David Berkshire is in here. So this is a later pictures from the 2000s. Um, Um, yeah, Wang Shifu personally checking Dantian during quiet meditation, teaching us hand palm reading. You're reading Bill's hand, I think in 2003, uh, somewhere in the mountains of Eastern Tibet. Walking Qigong. This is the 2006 trip in Yunnan. The first dance of the 14 movements, Wei Tuo Xian Su, Wei Tuo, the temple guardian, presenting the ritual stick. Standing Yu Zhou Zhuang universe dance. And, you know, very kind of more risky types of trips here into going into deep into Tibet on horseback, uh, kind of in 98. Shifu was always uh, there for most of these kind of excursions. And here you see a landslide, quite dangerous actually, uh, going in there, flooding that year, us getting stranded and being picked up by a truck, you know, uh, making it through these landslides areas and swollen waters, quite adventurous. Here is like spending the night on a concrete floor at 12,000 feet in Tibet at a road repair crew, uh, crew. This was all super adventurous and these are memories you never forget. Um, yeah, uh, in Tibet and us teaching the 14 together here in Guangxi province near Guilin, this wonderful mountains in the background. And at a Taoist monastery in Sichuan where we also stayed one time, but uh, suffice it to say um, that, you know, everything you learn in class from myself, from Lori and Tammy and Bill and the Jinjingung and, and Greg Sachs and the Jinjingung lineage, but also from every other teacher, this was our prerequisite 
that other than getting your prerequisite, your, your training in the regular TCM schooling system, whether it was from OCOM or from, you know, five branches or Pacific College or et cetera, um, everybody has a history of lineage study or because of your own interest, you wanted to go deeper. That is sort of the model that we're operating in. Every one of our teachers is bringing his own uh, interpretation uh, and viewpoint into the study of this medicine, the way how it is being presented. So please bear with them because TCM is easy to learn. It is an institutionalized, made for memorization, barefoot doctor, you know, a highly simplified system uh, made for two week crash courses, whereas you are learning the ancient lifelong learning based form of this medicine that has many, many different layers. And I just wanted to give you a little bit of a flavor of what this medicine can be, but also of the very direct, you know, the kind of masters that walk before you and that are directly or indirectly present in your classrooms as you learn from them. They didn't just go to a school and pick up a certificate, but they uh, have been learning for decades from people like the ones that I've been presenting to you. All right, good enough for today. It's been a pleasure and good luck with the rest of your, of this class that you, that Heather's organizing. It's been a pleasure to share this with you.